Silicon Valley is at a point where it's kind of at an inflection point on its own, where the cost is really high. A lot of companies are now moving to remote, so they'll, they call it like a mullet, where you have a headquarters in San Francisco, and then there's like 10 people there, and then you have 50 people in Utah. And so there's a lot of um, issues that are happening there, and I think Fort Worth is in a position where it's, it could be one of the best um, ecosystems in the world. From one university studio at the University of North Texas Health Science Center in Fort Worth, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth, the podcast where we highlight local innovation and the people bringing those innovations to market. I'm Cameron Cushman, and on today's episode, we'll tell the remarkable story of Cam Sadler, a former Fort Worth public school teacher who started a company on his summer vacation. Just a few short months later, he was in the winter 2018 cohort of Y Combinator, meeting with founders from YC alums that founded companies like Airbnb and Dropbox. Now he runs Newcraft, a platform designed to help job candidates get hired faster, particularly by top tech companies. Cam, welcome to Innovate Fort Worth. Thank you for having me. So Cam, you grew up in Fort Worth and are a product of the public school system here. At what point did you know you wanted to be an entrepreneur and that you wanted to start your own company? So when I learned how to build and sell, uh, I started off just knowing how to sell really well because um, my aunt Shirley would have me sell candy um, at the mini yards that used to be off of 8th Avenue. Nice. Um, and so that was kind of my introduction. I was like nine years old and selling candy out in front of the grocery store whenever we didn't get it run off. And um, that was kind of my introduction into just like having a product and uh, collecting money for it. Um, and I continued kind of down that path. Like I was the kid that had like a shoebox of my old CDs, like popped up at the middle school and just selling like all of my old stuff, um, making my mother angry. And I continued to just kind of hone in on those skills um, throughout high school and college. And then I hit a point where I wanted to create some type of like software um, and I didn't know how to build it. And so I reached out to a random company I found online and they quoted me at like $20,000 to build this platform. I was like, well, I don't, I don't have that, so I should probably figure out how to make it myself. And once I um, started just tinkering around and um, learning how to build software, I realized that I could probably turn this into a company. So Cam, tell us in very simple terms, what does Newcraft do? So we connect companies with candidates who have pending job or interview offers for a chance to interview them before they accept. So they've already been thoroughly vetted by a reputable company and they can use that offer, they can fully leverage that offer to sort of fast track through the typical job search interview process. That's fantastic. And you were a public school teacher at I think Dunbar High School, is that right? Yep. And you decide to start a company and then just a few months later you end up in Y Combinator. So tell me how you got the idea and how you went from public school teacher to startup founder. Yeah, so I, Um, After spending like four years um, as a teacher in my last year, I was a career coach. I just constantly saw students that didn't have a lot of leverage in the labor market. Um, And it was more so a like opportunity bottleneck. It was like there's a bunch of opportunities and a bunch of work and there's a bunch of untapped talent. but There wasn't an easy way to bring them together. And that was kind of the core thesis. Um, And I knew I wanted to do something different to solve the problem. I wanted to take a different angle. And so I retired from teaching. I literally pulled up my like $15,000 that I had left in um, like some random retirement fund and um, just started like building again. And I spent that summer, uh, I actually came up with the idea in Denver with my mom and brother. Uh, when we like, I just asked myself of, and asked my brother a fundamental question of like, why isn't there a website that someone can go to and get paid work opportunities within 20 minutes? And that sort of founding question set off the next 18 months. Well, that's fascinating. So you quit your job as a school teacher, you cash in your IRA, and, and you're off to the races. Uh, what was the first thing that you did to get the company started and to kind of start building it? Yeah, uh, so I started with like using Airtable 
um, as just like a, a, a form where I could collect interest from uh, candidates. Um, so like I was focused on really building out a talent pool. I figured if I had that, I could figure out what the other side looked like. So I started with just like an embedded Airtable in a website and I sent that out to my friends that I knew were software developers. And, and it turned out like none of them knew that they could like make money outside of their job. And so we kind of, I continued to kind of go down that um, that lane and collecting feedback from them and letting them know like the opportunities that exist in contract work. So Cam, you're a school teacher, but clearly you have an idea for a startup. How did you go about that process of preparing yourself to leave a steady job that you knew well, that was you know helping educate the next generation to risking it all on a tech startup? So I started making a lot of noise internal at the school. Like I just took a lot of risk. I tried, I submitted so many crazy programs um, to like my supervisor and principal. Uh, that I'm pretty sure they were ready for me to go anyway. Um, uh, one of them that comes to mind was um, I wanted to create a student vendor process. Like I remember seeing like um, a random guy selling like, um, like hot dogs at a basketball game that had no affiliation with the school. And during the day, I would see my kids get shut down for selling candy. Um, you could probably, you know, I would probably be empathetic to like, right. kids <laughs> selling candy. Um, and so I would, uh, when, I, when I saw that, I wanted to do something about it. And so that was one of the big things that I like just kicked and fought for, never got passed. But when I, I think doing that, like just start internally, like trying to innovate and create, and it really gets your juices flowing. And it also puts you at like, it just sort of keeps pushing you on the, to the end of the ledge until you're ready to like jump off completely. Very cool. So I know that Newcraft has gone through multiple iterations and pivots as you've kind of tried to hone in on your exact audience and your exact business model. I noticed recently too, you were talking a lot about apprenticeships in your social media and things like that. Tell me about how you've kind of decided to make those pivots and how that's led you to where you are now. Yeah. So this will come out as a surprise to pretty much everyone that's followed Newcraft, but I actually don't believe in the pivot at all. Hmm. Um, and I think like the lean startup mythology, quoting uh, Keith, um, an investor at Founders Fund, I think it's almost a guaranteed failure. I think the, the thing that's most important is to have an idea and a vision and to really stick with it and see it through. And on the outside looking in, it looks like we have not done that with Newcraft, uh, but we actually have. Like our, the, the initial goal was just to build a new hiring signal and connect people with work opportunities. And we've scraped pretty much every possible corner for solving that problem, but the problem hasn't changed. Our core user uh, candidates and untapped talent hasn't changed. And uh, the thing that we've been able to iterate on is just like our solution. We were never married to like forcing a random solution down uh, someone's throat, but this, we wanted to stay in this space. And so the, the thing that we found that works really well for candidates now is finding candidates that are at a certain inflection point and using that as a hiring signal to get them into companies faster. So uh, the first inflection point that we built out um, 12 months ago that almost everyone would think that we pivoted away from now, but it was actually like a payout tool for contractors. And so we would use the data on which contractors were getting paid the most and earning the most, and then connect them with work opportunities based on that as a signal. So it's basically like your earnings as a hiring signal. Then um, we sort of went down this path and um, found more inflection points. And so the top inflection point now is like a candidate who has a pending interview. Like if a candidate is interviewing at Robinhood in two weeks, there's a bunch of tech companies that want to talk to that candidate before they go into it. Um, and then there's like pending offers and other things that we can tap into. So you're using like existing market signals, but you're kind of using them in a different way to get people jobs faster or higher paid jobs or get them more offers all at the same time. Absolutely. And then they can compare those offers and kind of decide which one they want to use the best. Yep. And so when you say that contractors uh, are, you know, you're, you're seeing how much you're getting paid for their contracting work, what kind of contractors are you talking about? So mostly software developers, like 70% of the folks we work with today are full stack software engineers. We're slowly figuring out the next um, roles to expand to but that's what makes up the community now. So these are not contractors that are uh, painting your house or fixing your windows. These are guys that are uh, tech tech contractors essentially, yep. right? So coders for hire, developers for hire, things like that. Yep. Okay, great. So how big is your team? How many people work at Newcraft? Five. Five, okay, very good. And what, is, what does that makeup look like? So uh, four software engineers, one designer. 
Okay, very good. <laughs> That's how every tech company is supposed to work, right? Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned at the top of the show, we think you are the first ever entrepreneur from Fort Worth to get into Y Combinator. Um, now, first off, educate our audience a little bit about Y Combinator. How did you find out about it? And most importantly, how'd you get in? Yeah, uh, so YC is essentially an investment firm, but their portfolio is valued at like $100 billion now. Wow. Um, because they, um, a, a guy named Paul Graham started writing like $6,000 checks to uh, college students um, in the summer of like 04. And uh, the first college student that he wrote a check to was a guy named Drew Houston, who went on to start Dropbox. And hmm. um, every summer yeah. he continued to do that and he eventually expanded outside of college students and um, landed companies like Airbnb, Instacart. Um, he found those companies very, very early in their process. And, and now they, every year they um, accept hundreds of companies. Um, they invest $150,000 now, so a little bit more than 6,000 and they fly them to Silicon Valley for a three month program to uh, help them focus on their companies and raise more money. Fantastic, and you were in the winter 18 class, right? So how many classes do they do a year? Two classes. Two classes, okay, very good. Um, so what was your experience like at Y Combinator? So you get off the plane, you're the first ever uh, entrepreneur from Fort Worth to show up at Y Combinator. What was that like? It was pretty crazy. Uh, I would say the uh, most intense three months of my life, um, there's like a hundred other companies that are in this, at the same stage as you, a lot of talented founders. And every Tuesday, you're coming in to uh, present the goals that you met over the last week to that entire group. And uh, that like intensity and that pressure to constantly like grow your product and make your business as good as it can be is an intense thing, but ultimately a, a positive thing. Very cool, so how did you get in? What was the secret? It's interesting. The, the thing they told us was they l loved the way we were approaching the market. Um, and that's as much feedback as, as I got. Wow. I would say to uh, another sort of piece of counterintuitive advice that I would say to the founders that are thinking about applying is the execution matters a lot, but the idea actually does like matter just as much. Um, specifically, sort of knowing how to navigate um, the idea maze. YC really looks for ideas that are um, unconventional and that are some sort of narrative violation. Like the classic one, I guess the cliche, like everyone's heard this now, but like staying in a stranger's house is like such a narrative violation. You would never think that someone would build a marketplace like that and be successful. Um, and then there are like tr other narrative violations that aren't like, you know, based on strangers or breaking some cultural norm, like uh, Dropbox. Like there were so many other competitors to Dropbox. And he was very late into that space. Uh, but he saw that he could build a better product. And just being that late in a crowded market was a narrative violation too. A narrative violation, I've never heard that term before. That is really cool, That's a, what a great concept. So kind of like a disruption, but it's just a, a narrative that the we have that um, somebody's going in and, and upending or changing. Yep. So who was the most interesting person that you met during your time in YC? Too many to count. Um, there's a, a lot of really interesting people. I would say the one that's top of mind right now is uh, Paul Buckeye, who invented Gmail. Uh, like he's like ranked like um, really high in the YC investor network. He invests in like 20 startups every demo day, um, if maybe more than that. And uh, just super, super smart. He hosts um, a, an off a special office hours. He comes in like one time into YC to host an office hour with every single company. And it's called the $100 billion office hours. And it's basically you have to talk him through how your company becomes a $100 billion company. That's fascinating. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And yeah, now we all have Gmail accounts today and now he's impacting the world in totally different ways, huh? Yeah, like that's just, crazy. That's, in, that's incredible. So you mentioned the demo day at the end of the YC program. Obviously that's intended to get you in front of a bunch of venture capitalists and other investors and you hope that they're gonna write you a check, right? You hope they're gonna fund you. What was that experience like and how did you go about raising capital for Newcraft? Yeah, so for us, we, we didn't have market, product market fit at demo day. Now, what is product market fit for our audience who may not know? Oh, there's so many definitions. Um, <laughs> I, I like the Mark Andreessen classic definition when like your phone is blowing up, your email is blowing up, and you have so much demand, so many people want to pay you for your product that you like can't handle it. Um, and so we weren't, we were not in that situation at demo day. Um, and we had a good team, uh, we had good plans, we had some traction, but we were still a bit early. So our strategy was um, to raise 
as much capital as necessary, um, like to not overdo it and to get back to building as fast as possible. So we didn't do like a three month fundraise or anything like that. Um, we, we were fortunate to pitch at YC Demo Day and that gave us good reach to like our initial investors. Like we, outside of the YC Demo Day inbound interest from investors, we had one um, intro to an investor. Every, everyone outside of that intro just came from our demo day pitch. And so you closed the round, you closed your seed funding round pretty quickly after the demo day because you weren't trying to raise a lot of money, but, and you wanted to get back to building. Yep. So how long did that take? So we were, we were done with our seed round by end of May. And um, we pitched demo day uh, like end of March, like March 29th. So we had you know probably about a six to eight week process. So you got through a due diligence process and term sheets and all that really quickly. Yep. And is that kind of typical for YC or do they, because I guess part of the thing that investors are investing in is the YC brand that they've obviously vetted you and selected you and, and put you through their process. So does that kind of de-risk it for the investors? Yeah, I think YC has done a good job of just like standardizing so much stuff. Like we have so much stuff we didn't even have, like investors didn't have to think about, we didn't have to think about. It's like all 120 companies are Delaware C Corp. They all have submitted the necessary paperwork to YC. They have all their ducks in a row. And so you kind of get past all of that and you can just focus on people. So what advice would you give for someone listening to this podcast who wants to be the second local entrepreneur to get into Y Combinator? <sighs> oh, that's, that's a lot of pressure. I would say aim through uh, Y Combinator instead of at it. Uh, huh. That was probably the best advice I got when I started thinking about the process. Like YC wants to fund um, founders, everyone wants to fund founders that really don't need them, that are gonna succeed either way. Um, and so I would say like, just really focus on your business and um, the rest will take care of itself. Got it, that's great advice. So what is your overall impression of the entrepreneurial ecosystem in Fort Worth? You've been here, you've built, you're building a seemingly very successful startup so far, even though you're early on in the journey, what would your advice be, uh, or what's your overall impression of the entrepreneurial ecosystem here in Fort Worth? I think it has a great potential. Uh, like I've, I think more potential than a lot of places that I've been, including Silicon Valley. Uh, like Silicon Valley is at a point where it's kind of at an inflection point on its own, where the cost is really high. A lot of companies are now moving to remote. So they'll, they call it like a mullet where you have a headquarters in San Francisco and then there's like 10 people there and then you have 50 people in Utah. Um, and so there's a lot of um, issues that are happening there. And I think Fort Worth is in a position where it's, it could be one of the best um, ecosystems in the world. Uh, the, the other impression is that we've kind of gone through an identity crisis. And I think that we need a like plural site, like Utah had plural site. Um, we need an exit or like a Brex, like we need a company that's at like that size that has, you know, a big headquarters in Fort Worth to really solidify our identity. Yeah, it was interesting. There was a great quote recently from Alexis Ohanian, the founder of uh, Reddit. And he said, I don't know why anyone would build a company in Silicon Valley anymore. It's just too expensive. It's too crazy. Uh, basically, it opened the door for places like Fort Worth because Silicon Valley's kind of all, all spent. You know, it's, uh, it's been Mecca for so long that maybe it's time to start looking outside of Silicon Valley. Definitely. So if you could wave a magic wand and fix one thing about our entrepreneurial community in Fort Worth, what would it be? I would um, add the right ingredients to our culture um, to set us up to produce like three to five of those companies that we talked about, like three to five let's say Series B post companies. Um, I think that's really like the first milestone. I think that's all it, all it takes. Um, it's like you have three companies that are at the Series B stage. Um, they have great products in the market. They have visibility that attracts talent and you know, the whole ecosystem just starts sort of flowing. Okay, so Cam, so let's say that Newcraft works out and you exit next week for a billion dollars. What's your next big idea? If I had a billion dollars, I would just try to find as many Fort Worth entrepreneurs as I could and write them checks. And they would love that. Yeah. <laughs> So what do you think the future is for Newcraft? For us, I, I think our like number one goal is to build new hiring signals for the next generation of workers. So over the next 18 months, like we'll, we'll continue to release um, more hiring signals. And our goal is to grow our community to you know, millions of candidates and a handful of really, really great companies. On the company side, like you know, 20, Series B plus companies that are growing to thousands of employees over the next few years is sort of the perfect uh, target for us. And um, 
it's, it's really just growth and continuing to hone in on that mission. So who's your favorite innovator in Fort Worth? Isaac Manning. Um, he was our first investor and um, he's involved in a lot of projects. Um, he's like an MIT grad, really, really smart person who has done a lot of technical work across the US. And um, he like wrote our first check, flew to Demo Day to California. And it's just been a great supporter who believed in us from day one. That's fantastic. That's great. Cam, thank you for joining me on Innovate Fort Worth. If you'd like to know more about Cam or his company, Newcraft, visit their website at newcraft.io. Mark your calendars for Global Entrepreneurship Week in Fort Worth, which will take place November 18th through 22nd, 2019. Over 30 different events will go down that week, and they're all focused on growing, educating, and connecting our entrepreneurial community. Join us in locations all over the city to celebrate entrepreneurship in Fort Worth. To learn more, visit gewfortworth.com. Thank you for listening to Innovate Fort Worth. We'll be back with more stories of local innovation very soon.